me. It was a, uh, I was reading this book right around the time of uh, uh, the next phase of my career. And in 2020, I, I was, oh, excuse me, uh, I was accepted into the University of Toronto uh, grad process program. So we started on that uh, in September, assuming it's still running. But uh, uh, so, so that's my story. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, uh, let's start with the lecture. Uh, that's my email. If anybody wants to uh, drop me an email, uh, criticize my talk, ask me some questions, whatever. Um, love talking dentistry. Um, so, so drop me an email. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, zero bone loss concepts. So a uh, little disclaimer here. I, I don't have any financial ties. I don't even know Dr. Linkovicious. I've never met him. I bought his book for like 200 bucks. That's it. Okay. But I highly recommend this book. Uh, if you're placing implants, uh, just doing the surgical part, read this book. If you're only doing the prosthetic part, read this book. I think this is uh, uh, it's an absolute must for those who are doing implantology. Okay. So, um, now I'm going to give you a shortened version of it. Obviously, I can't touch everything in an hour, hour and a half, uh, whatever how long this lecture is. Um, but these are concepts that I, I, some somewhat indirectly have been doing already, and then now it's changed the way I will proceed. Uh, you know, once we get back going, uh, hopefully I'll be able to implement some of the concepts as well. But it does make a lot of sense. So uh, my pitch to him: buy his book. So we'll start with a quote, and I apologize, I gotta move this a little. Yeah. Okay. I'll start with a quote, quote by uh, Dr. Linkovicious, okay? and he's a prosthodontist from Lithuania. No one factor is the most important to ensure crestal bone stability. It is the combination and interaction of factors that determine the outcome. Okay, and what you'll find in this lecture is that it really is, uh, a combination of surgery, it's a combination of prosthetics, it's a combination of periodontics uh, and biomechanics. So there's a lot of layers to this. And it's funny because implantology is notoriously so um, um, closed, right? We, doctors kind of want to claim it for themselves. And I think implantology needs to open up. Um, I was at a lecture once by uh, Dr. Picos and he says, you know, for the GPs out there, you know, you're kind of in a unique situation because you get to understand both the surgery and the prosthetics. Okay. And so he called it a, a hybrid dentist. And I think this is where Dr. Lukovicius is going is to understand it's not enough to just be a surgeon. It's not enough just to be the prosthodontist. They're so intertwined. So. We'll start with a couple basic concepts. These are not concepts that is really uh, new to anybody here. Um, so what is zero bone loss concepts? Well, it's really about not losing bone around your implant. I think this is a pretty much a given. Um, crestal stability around an implant when the bone has not receded or been lost. Okay, so we don't want to lose bone. But I don't want to you know, misuse that term, zero bone loss. When in fact, there are many times when we actually want bone loss, okay? But we control that bone loss, okay? And he refers to this as stable remodel. It refers to the presence of some bone loss uh, that stops after some time and does not proceed further. And I can think of many situations where this happens. Uh, immediate anteriors, where we're placing the implants subcrestally, Right, so we have we can get an emergence profile that's adequate. Right, uh, those that are doing indentulous implants, when well, in the lower mandible, will oftentimes sink those implants quite a bit and reduce bone. Uh, so we are, are we we are controlling that remodel. What we don't want though is progressive bone loss. Right, we don't want to lose stable bone. Uh, we want the stability of bone. We don't want to continually remodel. So one of the factors, okay, so you'll see in this presentation and in this book that there are, we're touching on every aspect of dentistry here, okay? But what's really unique about implants is that we have this instrument, 
right? We have the implant itself. And we are, uh, we have to know what our, you know, this instrument that we're screwing into people's jaws, right? But I think there's a bit of a disconnect here where we don't delve deep into understanding the design factors and how it affects the biology. So uh, I, I, for some reason, really gravitate to implant design. That's why Elaine, if you're listening, we're, uh, we're going to design an implant together in one day. Um, I think implant design has a bigger factor on biology than we give it credit for. Okay. You know, how many times have you heard, uh, you know, all implants, they all integrate, right? I'm sure you've heard it at lectures, you've heard it uh, tossed around. Uh, and it's somewhat true, but we want to delve a little bit deeper. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about implant design factors. Okay, so why do we want to discuss implant design? Well, um, I'm sure everyone's heard the name uh, Dr. Thomas Albertson. Um, he's uh, he's famous in the implant world uh, because he he really worked with uh, Brandemark. And he was instrumental in understanding implant surface texture and 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 and, and a lot more. His I mean, just search his literature; it's, it's extensive. Um, so he made a couple of points in a in a in a paper that he wrote, um, and it makes sense to this concept. Okay, so the first one he says is, you have to realize that oral implants are but foreign bodies. And that this fact explains osseointegration as a protection mechanism of the tissues. I think what we're trying to imply with implants is that we kind of want to sneak an implant in. We don't. Ex we, we want to trick the body into believing that it's there. Okay, that's not reality. There is no tricking the body. The body knows it's there. It's understanding how the body responds to the implant. Okay. Now, given adequate stability. Bone tissue and soft tissue is formed around titanium implants to shield them from the adjacent tissues, right? So it's the body's reaction to the implant. That's what we're interested in, okay? That's, understanding that is key to implant success, okay? Any foreign material placed in bone will be rejected, dissolved, resorbed, or demarcated with a dense layer of bone to protect nearby tissues, right? So that's interesting. I mean, obviously we can't dissolve an implant or resorb an implant, but we can certainly reject it, right? If you look at figure B, you'll see a picture of soft tissue integration. Why does that happen? You know, I still to this day never can understand why my implants fail. They do fail. I can never figure out why exactly, okay? Certainly they're demarcated with bone when they're successful, okay? Uh, and I like this term because it's, Understanding how bone interacts with the implant, that's important here. Um, it's why short implants work, right? I hear a lot of people kind of talking about short implants, when to use them, when to not use them, how to use them. It's different, right? But the reason it works is because it's a protective mechanism, right? It's that dense layer of bone on short implants that allow them to work, okay? I'm not gonna talk about short implants, maybe another talk, Shem, but um, short implants, it's the way it reacts to bone, okay? So let's talk about factor one, okay? The first factor he talks about is polished implant surface, okay? Now, implants these days are not really polished anymore, okay? There's a, a trend towards uh, roughing the implant surfaces, and I get that, okay? But this implant has been a classic. I've never actually placed a tissue level before, but this is a Strawman tissue level. It's been a mainstay for Strawman for so many years. It's a great implant system, okay? But remember, the first implants were not roughened. They were polished, okay? And what did we learn from that, right? So the studies show that there is bone loss around the polished implant surface, okay? So why is that? Why does it resorb around machined implant surfaces? So they call that stress shielding. It's because, like short implants, bone likes stress. Not too much, not too little, just the right amount, okay? So they call it stress shielding. So what that means is on a smooth surface, 
there is no interaction between the bone and the titanium surface. So it gets non-functionally resorbed. Okay, so non-functional bone, bone resorption. Okay. That's why classically, back in the day, those implants, the Brandenburg implants, would resort to what? The first thread, right? Because that thread is what is giving the load to the implant. Okay. So back in the day, they would expect that. They would plan for that. All right. So that's what that looked like there. So they would be polished, be an external hex, and resorb down to the first thread. Okay. That was their normal protocol. But nowadays, we're moving away from polished implant surfaces. So we have to understand this surface, right? There's a lot of science going on right now on, on implant surfaces, right? Not just the implant, but the abutments as well. Um, we have zirconia implants now, and that's changing the game again. So a, a lot of science. But basically, and I don't want to get into all the details here, but, you know, there's a topographical, chemical, mechanical, and physical properties of the implant surfaces that have an impact on the hard and soft tissue. Okay. And generally speaking, what we're talking about is bone likes rough surfaces. Generally speaking, it's that dynamic load, right? Not too much, not too little. Osteoblasts proliferate better on a roughened surface. Okay. So there are plenty of studies that, that show that. Damn, Shem, 96 people now. <laughs> well done, my friend. Originally, he says, it was a small talk, small talk. Right? So anyway, uh, so generally speaking, bone likes rough surfaces. Uh, soft tissue likes smooth surfaces. And biofilm likes rough surfaces. So why does this matter? Because now we've got multiple different uh, multiple tissues with multiple surfaces that need to interact and how do they need to interact and where do they need to interact okay so we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that okay so take away from this do not place implants with a polished collar below the bone level makes sense right however a polished surface may attract less plaque and promote better tissue response and we'll, we'll discuss that later Okay, so understand your weapon of choice. That's the, the main takeaway. So factor two. This part was drilled home um, for me. It, this was such a, a, a big topic where I, I studied implants. Um, uh, it's about the, the micro gap, the implant abutment connection, okay? Um, and why that's so important to, uh, to, to, to bone levels. Okay. And the shadow to a lane, this is on the left, you'll see an ankylos implant, one of the dense spines. This is a classic implant, and it, it, it changed the game, in my opinion. Okay, so this study, um, if you've done enough implants, you'll, you'll come across this video. This is a, um, uh, such a classic study. Um, the, there's a, a backstory to this that, that I think we should all know is that this was purposefully hidden from the public for, for some time, okay? Because it showed uh, the, the, the deficiencies of implant design, okay? So let's, let's play that. This was done at Guta University where I did my master's in implant biology, okay? And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a micro CT of an implant that's embedded and a load, a tangential load is placed on this implant. Okay. And what you're seeing is what they call micro movement. Okay. Our implants are loaded constantly when we chew on. And I suppose we expect them to be solid, right? But these are all machined uh, tools. They have, uh, uh, they can, um, they take load, but they will deform. And so every implant design has a certain amount of deformation. And what they notice is that Certain implants will deform more than others. Okay, so we'll talk more about that. Okay, so factor two, the micro gap. Okay. All two piece implants have a micro gap. Okay, the micro gap is the junction between the abutment and the implant, right? And it has been positively associated with crestal bone loss. Okay, so, but why do we? then have a two-piece implant, okay? We have it because it's more prosthetically flexible, right? 
we want to have an ability to interchange these abutments to the implant so we can have better aesthetics, um, put different types of abutments for different types of prostheses. Uh, so there is an advantage there, right? So the, the two problems that occur with a microgap is one, bacterial contamination. If you go back to that video, you'll see that those gaps, okay, they kind of pump, right? So inside an abutment, for those to remove old, uh, you know, flat on flat connections, you will be, you can smell that connection, right? Once you remove that abutment, that you know that that odor just comes right to your face. Okay, that's bacterial contamination, right? So imagine that constantly being rocked in and out of the implant. Okay, let's call that a pumping effect. The second problem is the micro movement, the movement itself. Okay, what does that do to the tissue, and how would the bone respond to that movement? Too many people joining now. I can't see my screen. So, what they say about conical connections, and, and most implants now are moving towards a conical connection, right? Uh, that they're bacterial free, and they're not, but they're there's less bacteria. Okay. And the studies show that the smaller the abutment angle, so the the the, the cone fit, okay, the smaller that is. The more stable the connection is, and therefore there's less micro motion. Okay? I think we, you know, we place an implants now. We understand this concept, right? That smaller abutment can cause some problems, right? It's not always easy to use, right? Cold welding, right? The implant system I use, uh, called the Medigen uh, Any Ridge, uh, it's so welded together you cannot remove that abutment by hand. I need a special driver to pop that loose and then remove it, right? Um, but what this does, it changes the mechanics of the implant now, right? So the thinner the abutment, yes, the thicker the wall of the implant could be, but now we have to look at the screws and how thin can the screws get? So there are um, you know, uh, mechanical issues that come into play, right? The other problem is that there are notoriously difficult to splint together. Doing bridges on an ankylose implant, difficult okay um and then there's emergence the thinner the abutment does that affect emergence i put a question mark there because you know i think a lot of people believe that the thinner the abutment right the, the, the less emergence you're going to get okay but i can argue the thinner the abutment the more tissue there is okay so so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that okay what is clear in the literature is that movement is detrimental to the bone and tissue, okay? That's uh, a shame. I think somebody's writing on my screen there. I'm not sure if you need people to see that or not, but, uh, oh, thank you, yeah, that's fine. Um, so movement is detrimental to the bone and tissue, right? And the one clear takeaway is this, is that conical connection should be placed subcrestally, no other type of connection. So the question now, that the sense of that is what's a conical connection? Now, there's some debate about this, and you'll have to talk to your implant company and, and do a little bit more research. But conical connection can mean anything from a two degree taper to a 45 degree taper. That's a big range, right? Two degree taper, like a bicon that has a press fit, like a true Morse taper, to a 45 degree taper, like a bi horizon, okay? The biovarizers will claim that that's a conical connection. I think it's pretty clear that the more tapered it is, the tighter the connection is. Okay, so less dependent on a clamping force. Okay, so and the reason that's important, as I said, we want to prevent that micro motion. Now, am I saying that biovarizers is a bad implant? Not at all. It's how you use it, um, where you use it, that's more important. Okay. Um, so one of the factors that comes naturally with a, um, a conical connection is a platform switch. Uh, switch. Uh, that platform switch was actually kind of discovered accidentally. I think it was a 3i implant. There was just, they didn't have the right abutment size. 
and it kind of just they put a narrower abutment and they noticed that the bone stayed better okay because what it does is a platform switch will move the micro gap so essentially where the bacteria is away from the bone right bone doesn't like movement okay uh the size of the step also matter the larger the step okay the, the distance from the gap to the edge of the implant their studies show that the bone holds up better there it also allows more soft tissue to go over the implant platform so that'll all be discussing sham you're right my uh my headphones have already kind of uh dying in power so uh be a moment i'm going to just turn that off and then go into uh, my my laptop uh, audio. Okay, so just bear with me here. Sorry about that, guys. No problem at all. While we're waiting uh, for Steve, I just wanted to make a quick announcement, and I did put this on the chat group: is that tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. we have uh, Dr. Goff Su coming in and speaking to us about uh, full mouth rehabilitation. Um, after that, the following day, we have Dr. Manisha Jindal at 12 p.m. She'll be talking to us about um, orthodontics, and we'll be finishing off the week with having um, Vic Jindal talking to us about um, the current dental con or the current condition um, in dentistry and the outlook of what things are going to look like post COVID-19. Um, it should be a very good one, and we're looking forward to that one as well. Steve, are you good to go? No, I think we're still waiting on them. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So let's move on to, um, I think I talked about this slide already. Right. So, so what we're trying to do is create stability of that implant, right? So pumping effect of bacteria gets into the, the tissues, right? And we want to prevent micro movement because tissue, bone tissue, soft tissue, does not like movement, okay? And this concept is really about homeostasis. The body doesn't want this type of change. So what we wanna to try to do in implantology is make sure that there is little movement, little change as possible. Soft tissue, hard tissue, homeostasis, okay? Okay, so here are two implants, right? On the left, a dense ply ankylose implant. On the right, a uh, BioHorizons 45-degree uh, 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 conical connection, okay? So you can see there's a, a significant difference, right? Which is a better implant? Okay, there is no better implant. What it is, well, Elaine, you might disagree, <laughs> but it's how you use this, okay? They will behave differently in the tissue, okay? And the implant companies will have to compensate for uh, this particular design, okay? If you look at the BioRizon, they no longer make this implant this way, okay? And they took away that, uh, that bevel in a way, okay? You'll see at the top there that there is a 45-degree uh, bevel. Those can actually break, and they had to change the type of titanium that they use. They use the, uh, not a commercially pure anymore, right? So uh, they have to add a material that has been shown to be, to have a bit of an interaction with tissue. Right. So understand your implant. Now I'm going to pick on bio, uh, sorry, Nobel a little bit. I mean, who doesn't like to pick on Nobel a little bit, right? So here are three Nobel implants. On the left, this is a Nobel replaced with a conical connection. In the middle, a Nobel replaced with a trilobal connection. And on the right, an external hex. Uh, this is a Nobel speedy, okay? And they all behave differently. So this is the Nobel Speedy. This is the external head. So we'll start there. Um, this particular implant design is still on the market. This was designed by uh, Palomalo, um, specifically designed for his all-in-four concept. Okay. Now, I have a bit of a problem with this implant. I don't have a problem with the design. I mean, he, he put this out there so many years ago. And, um, you know, I don't blame anybody for uh, uh, you know, advancement in science. But what you will notice is that the implant company will, will, will prey on us doctors a little bit. OK, 
okay? Not all of them, not all of them, but some. So you have to understand uh, the way that that business works a little bit, right? So don't get fooled that every implant system is exactly the same, it is not. And so hopefully by going through some of this, you'll better appraise the implant system that you're using, okay? Uh, this external hex system, okay? So what do we know about that? Well, we know that this is a flat on flat connection essentially, right? And based on that video, we know there's micro motion, right? And bone and soft tissue reorganize around micro motion and the micro gap. So where is the micro gap? Right on the flat, flat connection. So let's take a look. So let's say we put a restoration in, okay? Flat to flat connection. What's gonna happen to that bone, right? It's gonna resort, right? That crest of the bone is not gonna be happy around that connection taking it in and out, in and out. The tissue is gonna reorganize around that area, okay? Now, may still be a functional implant, no problem. We see bone loss all the time, but there is a distinct problem with this design, is that if that happens, we still have a surface to worry about, okay? Now this picture, lots of tissue, so no big deal. Okay? And we'll talk about tissue thickness later, but now we have an exposed implant surface. And that exposed implant surface is a, a bacterial haven, okay? This uh, tyunite surface um, has been, I mean, every implant system, it's rough, right? So plaque loves this type of surface. This is the Nobel trilobe, okay? Uh, no longer on the market. Uh, what can we expect here, right? This is roughened all the way to the top. So this is essentially a crestal implant, right? Bone level implant. Implant goes in, what do we expect, right? Is the bone that's so close to that interface, is it gonna enjoy that, that environment? Unlikely. That's why for those who've seen uh, classic Nobel trilobes, you will see bone loss all the time, okay? You can expect it, so it'll reorganize. And again, this is a problem because now we have an exposed implant surface that bacteria like and that tissue doesn't like. So what I find interesting, you can see this in the, tr this is uh, two of the same implants, okay? This is both trilobe Nobel replace implants, okay? I don't think they make the, the one on the left anymore. I think they only make the one on the right, okay? Now, why do you suppose that is? Because I think they figured out that this is not a bone level implant, okay? So let's take a look. If we put it at the crest, what can we expect? Well, this is polished now, right? So we know bone doesn't like polished uh, uh, implant surfaces, and there's a micro gap right at the bone level. So we can expect that type of bone loss, but not a big a deal because now the implant surface is no longer rough uh, at uh, where it matters, okay? So in reality, this implant should be a soft tissue level implant, okay? And that should be deli delivered there. So that the micro gap, right? And that connection is in the tissue because the tissue is gonna, not necessarily enjoy it more, but will behave better around tissue than bone, for sure, okay? So then we move to a conical connection, right? And we said that a conical connection has a more, uh, 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 it gives less micro motion, so it's more stable. It also brings that connection away from the bone. So the bone is no longer disturbed by it as much, okay? And now the tissue can reorganize around the implant uh, and, and give a thicker volume around there. That's the benefit of the platform switching, okay? So there's a big benefit in, in a conical connection. And a conical connection should be, uh, is the only type of implant that should be placed subcrestal, okay? Again, the surface is now 
away from uh, the oral environment. Okay. So now take those concepts, take those, those mechanical concepts of your particular implant design, okay? And now let's throw that into this next concept, the vertical soft tissue thickness. And I'll be honest with you guys. Um, and you guys be honest too. How many people here check vertical soft tissue thickness? I, I mean, for years, I never checked this, man, <laughs> right? Uh, and I comb beam everybody, but I never truly check this, right? I check buckle thickness. For sure, I check buckle thickness. But does buckle thickness of tissue, is that what correlates to biologic width? No, it's a vertical tissue, right? So I'm a firm believer now. Um, so Azim gave me my first opportunity to do a lecture. Thank you, Azim. Um, and it was on guided surgery. And um, I, I do a lot of my surgeries guided. And I, I, I hear a lot when I do my lectures on guided surgery is that, uh, you know, it, it's, just a, it's just a method of putting an implant into bone. And it's not. I think what guided surgery is, is it's, it's about opening the, the, the information for you to see better, okay? There's tools that this technology gives you so you can see uh, the, the environment that you're dealing with, okay? And one of the advantages of cone beam, okay, is looking at vertical soft tissue, okay? These are both implants that I planned and did, okay? Look at the one on the left, okay, premolar region, Look how thin that tissue is. Can you guys see that? The, the yellow line is the outline of the, uh, uh, of the cast, the, the scan model, okay? And then obviously you can see the bone crest. Now you can measure how much tissue that is. Now, if you go back and you take your implant, whatever implant design that you have, and put it in that range, okay? You're gonna start to now see where your implant design affects your tissue, okay? We'll get more into this. And now look at this, this is a molar region. Look how thick that tissue is, over four millimeters, right? So now I'm feeling pretty good. This, this implant site's got a lot of tissue for me to work with, okay? And we want tissue. If at the end of this talk, if we could just kind of if everyone could let me know how many actually check vertical soft tissue, I'd actually like to, to kind of get a, a count. There are um, oh, almost 95 people now, Sham. If, if we can, I, I just want to get a sense of how many people um, did or did not. So if you could give an, an answer, yes or no, on vertical soft tissue, that'd be, uh, it's just a, kind of an internal um, study that I want to do and see Steve. how often it is. Steve, I can set up a poll right now. Um, can you be more specific? What is the question exactly? Just the how question many, is, go ahead. how many people specifically looked at vertical soft tissue, not horizontal, vertical soft tissue in their implant site okay. and actually measured it? I'd like to see. Okay, consider it. It better. could be that I'm the only one that didn't check it, so <laughs> I want to be sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. So why is that important? Well, it's about biologic width, right? And we talk about this a lot. Um, and what I've come to learn after reading this textbook, I'm not sure I really understood biologic width very well. Um, but I think I have a better understanding. Now, admittedly, uh, I'm not a periodontist. And if, Tina, if you're watching, uh, thank you. Um, she's a periodontist, she's an expert. Uh, I will probably butcher this so I can, I'll appreciate any type of uh, um, uh, criticism afterwards. So, so uh, please feel free to let me know. But biologic width, in a sense, is, is protection around your implant, right? Okay. Oops, sorry, let me go back. And that's the vertical soft tissue component. Right. Sorry, I have some computer issues here, just bear with me one second. Uh, the joys of doing things online. Okay. So the function of the peri-implant tissue 
right, is to maintain that homeostasis we were talking about, right? The internal environment, um, the internal environment that's now challenged because of the, the dental implant, right? Vertical soft tissue is the aspect of soft tissue in the involvement of the biologic width. Biologic width is a protection mechanism. I think that's the key part, right? It's that protection mechanism. And not all tissue protects as well as others, right? Some tissue thick and healthy, others thin and just uh, not as, doesn't give that level of protection that other uh, certain tissue do. And it, it's variable among people, right? Steve, would you like me to launch the poll now? Uh, sure, yeah, go for it. All right, so you can continue and I'll just let you know when we have a final tally. So uh, just either answer yes or no. And the question asks, do you specifically look at soft tissue and measure the tissue height when planning for implant placement? <laughs> the problem is it's on the middle of my screen now. Can't, uh... Is it out of the way now or no? Still in the middle? Still in the middle, yeah. Let me okay, so you can actually drag it out of the way, Steve. Okay. Or, or you can even minimize it if you'd like. Oh, that's good. Now. Okay. So, so let's talk a little bit about that, that the, the vertical soft tissue, okay, biologic width and what it is. It's so important to understand, okay? So there's two basic uh, uh, types of tissue, okay? Um, and without going too much into detail, and I'm certainly not the person to do so, uh, but we're looking at the epithelial attachment and the connective tissue attachment, okay? It's about on average, and depending on the study that you see, uh, three to four millimeters. So in this case, 3.8 millimeters is what he pulls, okay? So let's talk a bit about the epithelial attachment and why that's so important, okay? So if you break it down into sulcular, and junctional, okay? Um, all in all, about 2, 2.14 millimeters, okay? The sulcular epithelium is, resembles non-cratinized uh, uh, tissue, uh, like an extension of the oral epithelium, okay? The junctional epithelium, you, and you'll hear this many times in this lecture, is the junctional epithelium that's important. It's what attaches to the implant surface, and you've heard the term hemidesmosomes, right? Okay, the junctional epithelium is the attachment that appears to be the barrier to the oral environment on an implant. And then the other tissue is the connective tissue, okay? And routinely, it's about one to 1.5 millimeters, okay? It tends to reestablish very quickly, scar tissue-like, okay? It's constant, okay? And this becomes important as well. It runs kind of parallel to the implant or the abutment surface, and it doesn't really attach that well. Okay, so a lot of people uh, and implant companies will promote uh, this sort of connective tissue attachment when, in fact, it really doesn't attach that much at all. It's more like it's like a physical barrier. It just it's kind of just sits there. Okay. So here's a uh, a picture from uh, from from one of his articles, okay, where he's measuring this, right? Um, gotta admit, I never did that, right? Really important. Okay. So what he says is when there's a minimum amount of vertical soft tissue, right? And the biological width is insufficient, bone resorption will occur, okay? So that will get a sufficient amount of soft tissue attachment, right? Remember, it's the junctional epithelium that's the barrier, so we need that, right? And now, if we tie in some of the, the mechanical concepts where we look at implant design, platform shifting now allows for more vertical soft tissue, right? And horizontal, by the way, right? So what he says is that three to four millimeters is adequate vertical tissue height, okay? Less than three, you'll get vertical tissue, uh, bone tissue loss. Okay, so let's look at that uh, in, in this diagram, okay? So implants in, you got four millimeters of tissue, bingo, we're, we're happy, okay? Uh, the, that, that biological width. Now, I should make a point. There is no biologic width until the implant is exposed, okay? That's why you'll get, you know, it, it, 
if, if you've ever done an implant in the posterior mandible, you'll see this a lot. You see really, really thin tissue, right? So, and then, you know, the implant companies will tell you, oh, this is a bone level implant, right? So I've seen tissues like a millimeter and a half, so thin, but still a bone level implant. So what do you do? Molar, crestal, put that one millimeter tissue. It's still keratinized though, right? So it looks like it's, it's good tissue, still keratinized tissue. So you put that back and then bingo, bone loss. Where else you'll see that? Uh, if for those that do, do uh, uh, locators, okay, uh, dentulous uh, implants, posterior mandible again, man, you put a denture on top of that, that tissue will resorb that bone so fast. So be cognizant of the, the height of tissue that you have. So the crestal bone loss, you gotta bear with me, I'm having computer issues here, man. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that, give me just two seconds. Okay. So the four millimeters were good, right? Biologic width, four millimeters. So how do we get crestal bone loss? right? Take a look if we have two millimeters of bone, right? There's two things that, ha that, that come into play here, and it does, it's impacted by your implant design, right? One is the plaque theory, okay? One, there's, there's plaque and there's bacteria that's coming from your implant connection, right? The other is how much resistance of plaque is there to, uh, to the implant surface? Right now, in this case, if you had a, an implant that was placed in uh, uh, an area where there's two millimeters of bone, right? What will happen? It's going to resort to establish what biologic width, right? And it should be a note that the studies show that you'll get one to one point five millimeters of connective tissue anyway, right? So it seems to me that there's the, the difference will be in the epithelium, right? Where that's where you get the hemidesmosomal attachments, right? But the problem is if you have thin tissue to begin with, all right, and the biologic width reestablishes at three to four millimeters, now where's your implant connection? If you look at the figure, it'll kind of be hovering in and around where the junctional epithelium is, right? So now your micro gap interface, okay, uh, your micro motion could potentially be in and around the epithelium where you need the hemidesmosomal attachments. And if you keep on taking it in and out, right, your abutment to your implant, what are you doing to that attachment, okay? So that's why it's so vital that you, you, you understand this vertical uh, uh, soft tissue volume, uh, that measurement, it's biologic width. And I should mention, if you have, so let's say you, you have three millimeters, right? One to 1 1.5 is connective tissue already. So that leaves potentially 1.5, that's uh, junctional epithelium, the part that attaches to the abutment, right? A portion of that is going to be sulcular in nature, right? So that leaves just a thin barrier between your, the oral cavity and the implant surface. So what's the solution? The solution is to increase that vertical soft tissue. Right? So he talks about four methods. Um, the first one being uh, alveoloplasty. Second, subcrestal implant placement. Uh, third being ten pole technique. And the fourth being soft tissue augmentation. And I'm not going to get into the, uh, the, the, the details of this. You got to read the book, right? So... Uh, but just to give you an overall concept of what this is. Okay, alveoplasty. Now, truth be told, um, I don't do a lot of alveoplasty in uh, dentate sites, uh, it, you, know, you know, partially dentate sites, uh, mostly in a dentulus, right? Uh, and the benefit of an alveoplasty is it allows you to move tissue to where you want it. Okay, um, it, it, so this is not a, a perfect representation, but the idea is 
put the thick tissue where you want it to be. It also allows you to, to place those implants subcrestally. See, in my mind, what I'm always thinking is, what's my implant gonna look like after things remodel, okay? I want keratinized tissue buccally and lingually. I wanna place my implants subcrestally. I want the remaining bone to protect my implants, right? So that's by, by removing bone, you're gonna get sort of this in, inherent tenting event, right? And you'll see uh, in a later slide here how that can be affected on a, on a single site. My go-to is really subcrestal placement. And, and for me, I use a conical connection implant. Uh, I place every implant subcrestally. Um, I honestly cannot think of one where I don't place it subcrestally. I purposely want one to two millimeters of subcrestal placement. In certain cases, like an immediate anterior, you have to do subcrestal, right? So you want a, a good emergence profile. So let's talk a little bit about a subcrestal placement. So here, here's a case I did a while back. Um, this is a lower anterior, I believe. It's kind of zoomed in here, right? If you look at it, you'll see where the bone crest is, right? And the green lines outline where it resorbed to. Of course, the bone is gonna resorb. This is that controlled resorption we're talking about, right? It's gonna go down to established biologic width, right? There's a certain amount of tissue between the bone crest now and the abutment because of the uh, 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 the platform shift, right? So we're controlling that. But let's look at the vertical. If I were to place this crestally, we'd have a bit of a problem here. So let's look a little closer. If I go crestally, I only have two million, uh, 1.8 millimeters of tissue. And we can expect biologic width to, to reestablish, right? So now, I, well, one, I always place a subcrestly anyway, but this now gives me an adequate amount of vertical tissue. Now, this is part of that case as well, and this is not about the grafting portion, but you'll notice here, uh, this is an old technique, I don't do this anymore, this is a, a, a sonic weld. Um, anyway, that's <laughs> beyond the point. What you'll notice here is this is, for those that do grafting, this is kind of an, a, a nice site, isn't it, right? Because the graft envelope, right? We have the canine and, and, and the, uh, the incisor that gives this nice little pouch, right? Why do people always talk about grafting inside the graft envelope? Because the body doesn't want to have this excess amount of tissue. It's going to resorb. Um, uh, one of my mentors once told me, uh, the body doesn't like hills and valleys so much. It likes things kind of flat, right? So that's why we always sort of tend to graft um, within a graft envelope. Now, if that canine wasn't there and the canine evidence wasn't there, this would be a much harder graft to do. Okay? So the reason I bring this up is not specifically about the grafting. It's about, okay, so there's another view, right? You can see where the peaks of bone, nice, I've got a nice little pocket for, uh, for me to put my uh, allograft into. Um, but there is that envelope that we're talking about. Right? I don't decorticate that much anymore, but uh, um, for this particular case I did, I think it was kind of dense cortical bone. Uh, there's the allograft, uh, membrane, um, and then six months later, we put the implant into position. Okay, but the reason I talk about the graft envelope is, um, sorry, let me go back. It's because of the interproximal peaks. Oftentimes, when we talk about graft envelope or bony envelopes, we're talking from a buccal dimension, right? But what about a vertical dimension? we have interproximal bone. That interproximal bone acts like uh, a hammock pulls, right? So that the tissue does not naturally want to be uh, uh, apical. It, has, it wants to be more coronal because of the adjacent peaks. Does that make sense, 
right? So, so we're driving the biology uh, or the biology is helping us in these types of situations. That's why we can place this subcrestally, right? Because the tissue now will act like a hammock next to the, 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 the adjacent teeth. Plants in. Compression. Look at the tissue, lots of tissue, right? Now that clefting there, to be honest, uh, if you look at the teeth next door, um, the hygiene, not the greatest. I think I had to scale this just to take this picture. Uh, okay, and you'll see that graft envelope, right? Even if I were to have uh, grafted buccally, uh, you know, three millimeters, four millimeters, likely it's just gonna resort back to this volume anyway. So I want you guys to think about that from the vertical dimension as well. What happens if you have two teeth that are very close together, right? You're gonna have some, uh, some protection. What happens if you have two teeth that are further apart? You're not gonna have that same type of, uh, of biological resistance, right? So we'll see how this sort of plays out. We'll see that tissue, uh, that bone tissue will go down to the, the platform, right? And there's the final crown. Now here's sort of a, a, another example, why vertical height is so important, okay? Quad three, look at the prosthetic space here, right? There's virtually none. So even if I go to place the, the implants crestally, I'm kind of screwed here because I'm not gonna have any room for, um, um, for my prosthetic. But at the same time, I'm now establishing um, my biologic width by placing it subcrestally, right? So, you know, one alternative could have been to, um, to cut the bone down, right? Uh, I think I did a little bit, but I didn't want to do it too much because I'm trying to control the resorption here, right? So inter, interproximally, chances are you're going to get a little bit of uh, uh, a bone loss there, right? But the, the tissue is now going to sit uh, and protect as much until it starts to remodel. Okay. So it brings me to so subcrestal placement. One of the criticisms is, well, the connection is still so deep. What happens there, right? And so some smart people uh, thought of a different concept, and what they called it is the uh, one abutment, one time. And, and the idea is we don't really want to disturb the, the, uh, the connection between the, uh, the, the connective tissue, the junctional epithelium, and the bone, because uh, again, it doesn't like movement, doesn't like the micro gap, and we want to bring that more coronally. And so there are different concepts here, but essentially it's like a multi-unit abutment, right? And what happens is, is they bring that abutment and it's there to stay, okay? Essentially though, what this is, is the soft, uh, a, a tissue level implant now, right? So there, there are some studies that show that a disconnection can influence the stability of the biologic width, and that makes sense. Um, it's, I think the evidence is still, uh, it, it's not concrete. Um, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. I, I do believe there is some merit to it. I think the more, uh, the thicker your tissue is, the less likely it's going to be susceptible to, um, to uh, a negative effect to the bone uh, based on these disconnection connection events. Okay. And there's other techniques as well. Um, one of them uh, is called the umbrella technique. And maybe some of you have heard of this, okay. And the whole idea here is to maintain that vertical tissue, right? Um, and I, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, um, what about the emergence? Doesn't that affect it? And, and I think that it does um, to some degree. These concepts, though, you kind of need to place the implant deep enough. And this is where uh, implant position is so important to emergence. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Okay, so, so you can see here though that the, the thinner the abutment, the, the more tissue there is vertically, right? Okay. 
So we'll move on to the next technique. Uh, he calls it the tent pole technique. Where I do this most often, uh, I have to. Admit, I don't do this a lot on single sites or double sites. I'll do this a lot on edentulous sites where I'm doing, especially locators, right? So that case I showed you earlier, if I have four locators, loading them, what is entry going to do? Entry to absorb that bone guarantee. So if you're placing implants uh, uh, in the bone, and you press lead, you have to and you're putting uh, a denture on that, right? You're going to get resorption. So one of the ways I ground it, make sure that I have an issue in, in the bone, is I'll do a simple technique. You see what it is, is a totally covered. And so even if there is that resorptive effect, that abutment is going to preserve tissue and protect that bone, okay? In the context of zero bone loss concepts, what he's talking about is, um, so look at figure F, E and F, okay? Figure E and F, look how thin that tissue is. What he's doing here is he's putting that healing abutment and then closing over top and that coagulum is gonna turn into tissue and he's done studies to show that, okay? So I think that's a really neat uh, 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 technique, a simple one is at, at that. Now, I'm gonna show you, so if you look at figure A and B, okay? And we talked about that uh, hammock effect, right? The envelope, take a look at that, that tissue, that technique, right? That tissue has a propensity to be held higher now. So you're gonna get a little bit more vertical. Okay. And then figure C and D, that's, that's a technique I like the most, is a subcrestal placement. And as it reorganizes, yes, it will take some bone with it. However, you'll get that vertical um, um, uh, soft tissue. Okay. And then lastly, uh, and again, admittedly, uh, you know, my, my soft tissue skills are not the best. You know, we'll, we'll talk to team one day. Um, so my vertical tissue augmentation skills need a bit of work. Um, and I, funny enough, I kind of did this technique by, uh, by uh, accident. Um, uh, so this vertical soft tissue augmentation, um, for those that do PRF, you guys do poncho techniques all the time, right? Where you're doing a PRF membrane, you put a bunch of hole, you put a, a healing abutment, and you close the tissue over top. Acts as a nice little barrier. But one day, I did that with mucograft because I didn't have um, PRF for whatever reason or uh, collagen membranes. And I just had mucograft, which is a, 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 a porcine uh, collagen membrane and close over top and got a decent result and have been doing that for some time. And then didn't realize that this is somewhat what his technique is. Now, not exactly, but uh, you do notice that that tissue does look a little bit better. Okay, so Linkovicius has done studies on the type of tissue that he uses. He uses, uh, he, he's done studies on, uh, on autogenous, uh, allogenic, and, and xenograft. And funny enough, his studies showed that uh, porcine xenograft had the greatest effect in vertical. We're not talking horizontal, but vertical uh, soft tissue gain. And uh, uh, all the other ones had some effect for sure. Uh, but not quite as much. That's why he recommends uh, a, a xenograft membrane. Uh, I think now they have, Geischlich has mucograft, but uh, something that's a little bit more robust is the fibro guide. Uh, I've never used it, so if anyone's used that, let me know uh, how that looks. Um, so, so as I said, uh, all materials can be used, auto, xeno, aloe, whatever you like, okay? But he recommends uh, porcine. So, um, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, for, for those that like to do autogenous, you know, it, it, it's, it should still work, but the concept still remains, okay? Uh, you can do this single or two-staged, um, so that, that's, that's kind of nice. But you do have to make sure you release the tissue adequately, so you are gaining volume, right? So, you know, whatever technique you need to do to, to ex get a little bit more um, release to... Uh, prevent that compression of tissue, okay? 
and you want to gain three to four millimeters of uh, vertical soft tissue. Uh, he did mention though that above five, you're running a risk of having some periimplantitis uh, concerns, uh, obviously for, for cleansability issues. Um, and again, it depends on the area, um, but yeah, five millimeters greater than that, uh, you want to be a bit careful. Okay. So, and then lastly with tissue, um, there's still some debate about attached keratinized tissue around the dental implant. Now, the literature actually, uh, the, there isn't a lot of evidence to correlate KT to uh, implant survival or bone loss or recession. Um, but the general consensus is have it. Okay, um, I think the perios in the, in the group will agree. Uh, I see it, um, you need to have KT. Uh, it's the mobility of the tissue. Uh, it does accumulate plaque, uh, it, it really does. And um, uh, so, so make sure you have in your repertoire or a, a good periodontist to, to be able to, to get that KT. Uh, in the book, he recommends having two millimeters of KT. Uh, both buccally and, ling and lingually. Um, I kind of disagree with that, just my, my personal opinion. I think four is better. Um, two millimeters maybe minimum. Uh, if, if, <laughs> uh, if, if they don't want to have the KT grab, but the risk is this, is that if you remodel a little bit, you're already short. And some of that is sulcular. Uh, you have vertical sulcular tissue. And so it doesn't really leave you a lot of KT around an implant per se. So uh, I personally think four is better. Um, maybe Tina could, uh, or other perios in the, in the group could uh, comment on that. Uh, but the literature is not set on that. Now, the reason I bring this up, this little diagram up, um, is in this particular situation, it's, it's not the best available evidence, right? Um, but sometimes you have to depend on clinical expertise, not mine, but, but the, the people that are writing these textbooks and, and, and really the, the key opinion leaders in, uh, in implantology. Um, and that's how uh, evidence-based dentistry is run, right? So for all those Facebook people, sometimes you, you get inundated with, with um, um, uh, topics and some of it seems crazy, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but to practice evidence-based dentistry, you really need all three of these things to, to do it, okay? Okay, so that's sort of the, the part one. I think we're an hour in. I uh, hope everyone's still doing okay. And we'll move to sort of the second half. Steve, uh, Tina just commented. She said, uh, fantastic lecture. Yes, in agreement with you all the way. Two millimeters is the minimum. Three to four is my preference. Perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's it's one thing to lecture in front of people who are, um, um, you know, traditionally I, I, I lecture in front of people who never even placed implants, so I can get away with a lot of things, right? But when you have you know oral surgeons and periodontists and, and whatnot, you, you get a little uh, anxious about that. People and I don't mind. Call me out on whatever I say. I, that's okay with me. Um, so anyway, let's move forward. Uh, now, this is sort of, the first part was sort of the, the mechanics and the surgical parts. Um, the next part is more the prosthetic parts. Um, and, and, and I really like this quote uh, in, in his book. He says, nothing destroys the work of a good surgeon as easily as a poor prosthodontist. Um, and I can vouch for that because I place my own prosthodontics uh, on my implants that I place. Um, and it, it's, it's certainly true. Uh, you know, as they say, Implantology is a, a prosthetically driven uh, profession, right? With a surgical component. Um, okay, so let's talk about prosthetic factors, right? Uh, of, of course, cement or screw retain. Does that have an effect on, on, on zero bone loss, right? Uh, emergence profile, for sure. Okay. And then here's, here's a topic that really, I, I never really gave much thought about. Um, Subgingival implant restorative material, right? That matters. 
and super gingival implant restorative material. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about that because it's more lab related stuff. So the, the first three we're, we'll kind of get into. So back in the day, um, yeah, I used to, to cement crowns. I'm sure many of you have, right? Um, but there's clearly a problem with cement cementing. Um, the residual cement is a risk factor uh, that I'm sure many of you have seen uh, for peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Absolutely. Right? And they've done studies on this. And Linkovicious has done studies on this. Right? The only reliable method to completely removing cement is to use a custom abutment that's super gingival. Okay? I started out using uh, stock abutments. Um, maybe some people still do, okay? Um, but clearly stock abutments, there's a problem. It's kind of a one size fits all phenomenon, right? If you look at a stock abutment, typically um, they were, uh, I remember BioRizing used to kind of uh, give you an abutment that was their implant jar, three in one abutment, I think it was called, right? Uh, so I think you could cement those on um, if you so choose. Uh, but the problem with these stock abutments, it, it, it's not necessarily compatible with every situation, right? Uh, there's undercuts. The cement margin is so low, you can't see, right? And the problem with the the cement margin being so close to the implant connection is that the connective tissue uh, that runs parallel there is not really that resistant to, to, to pressure. That's why you'll see some, and I got a, a, an x-ray uh, a few slides from now, where it seems like they're, they've pushed cement down like three threads, it seems like, right? How does it do that? It's because it's this connective tissue uh, it's not the connection part, okay? And we discussed earlier, it's the epithelium, right? It's those hemidesmosomes that are really that important. But now you've got your cement margin right along in that protective area, right? So you're not getting that seal. Whereas a custom abutment that you see on the left here, right? Now you can see it. And there's techniques that you can do to uh, minimize uh, the cement, right? So here's one. Uh, using a rubber dam, and, and, and of course, these are both of the, the there's two techniques I'm going to show you. They're meant for still custom abutments at relatively uh, equal crestal or super crestal. Okay, this is not first of all, you're not going to get that rubber dam when it's it's so deep into the socket, okay, yeah, uh, not the socket the, to, to the crest of the bone. Um, you're going to end up trapping rubber dam and it's going to be a nightmare to remove. Okay, so it's still meant for uh, equidistance or maybe slightly in the sulcular tissue, no, nothing lower than that. Okay? okay, another technique is cord. Okay, but the problem with this is still there is a um, there's still an undercut, right? But sometimes these techniques do work. Now, he does mention that there it's better. Um, um, but doing this technique uh, subgingively uh, is, is you still can run into problems. Okay, and then there's a famous technique, uh, Dr. Wa I believe Dr. Wadwani um, uh, invented this, but there, there's other groups that have, have shown me this as well, where they make a custom uh, prosthetic, uh, uh, a cementation jig, right? So what they do is they take the crown. And they line it with Teflon, right? And they put a PVS in it. Okay, and then now they have a, a, a coffee, right? And then take their crown, they cement it extra orally, remove the cement, okay, and then put it back intraorally in the mouth. Okay. But the Covicious research research shows that there's a big problem with this technique is that one, typically they recommend using uh, temp cement um, and coupled with the fact that by thinning it out so much, they, they often found that the, the discrepancy would, it, it, it would be inadequately cemented. So the retention was quite uh, uh, insufficient, right? So um, I think there's better ways to doing this now. 
Okay, so insufficient cement volume and in, inadequate retention. And they studied all this stuff. So take a look at this x-ray, right? Do we still want to cement? Um, look how low, this is again a Strawman uh, tissue level, right? Where we can expect that where that bone loss is going to be, right? And they cemented, like that's, that's a tough, tough area to clean. So there, it, it's virtually impossible to cement that. Now, the solution is, well, don't cement. <laughs> uh, but there, there are advantages to cementing, by the way. Okay, I'm not gonna touch on all of that, but there are advantages to cementing crowds. Uh, one kind of neat concept that, that is not exclusive to Nobel, by the way, but I'm just showing you Nobel, is the angulated screw channel, right? Um, where you can convert a, uh, a screw, uh, a cemented to a screw tamed uh, axis. Um, it's kind of a neat concept. Now, Nobel's have got still some mechanical issues because the abutment is still so short. Um, but I think uh, that some of the other companies, I know Densply has a, uh, they can use it with their Atlantis abutment. So it is quite nice. Okay. And then lastly, there's a, uh, what's called a screwmentable technique, right? Where you're coupling both cementation and, um, uh, so screw retain and cemented best of both worlds kind of thing, right? So the first thing is, uh, so obviously on the left is screw mentable, on the right is the traditional screw routine. On the left, you are delivering the abutment first, torque that down, and then cement it uh, interorally or extraorally, um, and, but at least it's retrievable in, in most cases, if you, uh, in particular, if you have an angulated screw channel, right? It's bringing that margin of the, uh, the restoration, of the cement line higher more corona. Okay. So let's go over a case. Where screwmentable technique is really powerful is uh, for uh, bridges when you're fixing two implants together. Okay. Um, because again, if you go back to the ankylose implants, those implant abutments are so steep, right? And so deep. If your implant angle is off even a little bit, you're not seeding that sucker back down, right? So how do you cement there? And when you go to cement a, a bridge, how easy is that to clean, right? It's, it's, it's stressful. It's like a race, uh, uh, you know, you're on a timer now, right? So a screwmentable technique here is very powerful. And I highly recommend that you, you learn this technique in, in these situations. Okay, so here's a case that I did. Um, in this particular situation, uh, two implants, um, in these are, uh, open tray, uh, engaging impression clippings. And there's a reason why I do this. Okay. And it looks like that. And I split them with some floss and some, uh, resin, uh, there's plenty of, you can use composite, you can use, uh, a pattern, uh, uh, resin, uh, lots of different ways to do this. Um, but I purposely will use hex here uh, because I want to know if I can draw this out, okay? Uh, so, so pressure copings are seated, right? So with the hex, if everyone's with me here, the hex elongates the impression coping, right? So that's why they call it engaging. Makes it harder to, to remove when it's splinted and the path, path of direct, uh, the insertion is, is off, okay? The reason I do this again, is if it's hexed, both of them, right? In the impression phase, I, I take that back. Before I take the impression, in this phase here, where, it's, uh, where there's a jig, it's, it's splinted together. If I can remove this here, then I know when I go to cement the final crown, I know I can remove it there. Make sense? So now let's say here, now these implants were parallel enough that I could remove this in one piece. Okay, so it gives me peace of mind. But there are times when it doesn't, right? And if it doesn't, what do you do, right? Well, you cut the jig. Easy enough, take the burr, boom, cut it in half, right? Take one of the mounts, cut the hex there, rejig it. Now take it out, okay? Oh, still doesn't. Take the other one, cut that one, okay? Now, the other option is to go both non-engaging, right? Certainly, 
you can do that. But for me, there's something to be said about cementation of the abutment when it's hexed. So if they're both hexed, right? That means you, you've probably done this, you know, freehand. If you're like a zine, your implants are so parallel anyway, I need to do this guided. Um, there's something to be said about a hexed abutment being in the right orientation, right? So if you can draw it from a hexed uh, uh, abutment, it's, it's kind of nice, okay? But the hex has nothing to do with the retention of the implant, okay? It's the conical connection that does. Okay, and why do I need that in this particular case? Well, it's, for me, this is more about not cementation per se, but it's about shade, right? In the anterior zone, you know, so, so there are the two implants healing nicely. Tissue looks good, okay? How many people think they can get that on the first try using a shade tab? Probably impossible, right? Right, you're not gonna go from that to that just on a couple photos, all right? So you need to be able to cement this, but it's a bridge and cementing a bridge is a pain in the ass, right? So I'm gonna do a screwmentable technique here, right? So I prevent cement sepsis, right? And if you get cement sepsis on a single uh, implant, for sure it's more likely to have it on a bridge, right? Okay, so the abutments go in. And now because I know this is retrievable, my lab, I can tell them to be a little bit more subgingival, right? And why do I want it to be a little bit more subgingival? Well, because I don't want that to show. I don't want that to show. I want to hide that margin the best way I can. And I believe one of these was a, uh, um, an angulated screw. I, I can't remember for sure. But these are now completely retrievable, right? Screw retained, but it's cemented in the mouth. Screw mentable technique. When it came to the final, okay, uh, my lab gave me non-engaging. Fine. On a bridge, once I see the abutments, okay, we, they, they give you a little jig or the, the bridge can be the jig itself, okay, it gives you the orientation of the abutments, right? And there's the final result. So, everyone with, with me so far? Hope everyone's okay. I'm just going to grab a little drink. So let's talk a little bit about how the emergence profile uh, affects bone loss, okay? Um, some literature suggests 25 degrees um, should not be exceeded. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that, to be honest with you. I think it depends on the location. Um, but there is one disturbing trend that I've seen uh, in some time, and in, in, in Link Vicious uh, mentions it as well, um, really wide, tie bases with very short gingival heights. Okay. I'm not a big uh, tie base user. I have more custom abutments, but this is a problem. And I don't blame doctors here. I blame implant companies. And I think they, you know, it's, obviously there's more logistics to this than, than I probably uh, am privy to, but um, you know, it's a recent event that uh, different tie base heights came about. Right, so I've seen um, quite a bit of these short tie bases that can be a problem, and this has to do with emergence profile, right? And emergence profile is not such a little thing, right? Emergence profile, you have to consider biologic width, you have to consider bone levels. Where is your bone piece? You have to look at implant depth. You know, the deeper the implant, your emergence is going to be different, right? Um, and based on your implant design, where are the contact points. Right? How does the emergence affect the aesthetics, the papilla, and how does that affect the cleansability? And to get that cleansability and that papilla just right, how much are you going to compress that tissue? Right? And then where are you going to cement it and so forth? Right? So it's, there's a lot going on with the emergence profile. Steve, and, um, yeah. so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. While you're on this uh, topic here in the previous case, Dr. Stephen Diana asked, um, so you torque the abutment and cement it intraorally. Um, that was his first question. And his second question was that does not address the excess cement issue of cementation intraorally. Um, it does allow retrievability. So uh, it does. 
in the sense that because the margin is super gingival, okay? So Linkovich's study showed that when you are uh, super gingerly cementing, okay? And now, you know, you're gonna be careful with how you load this. I, I'm not, you know, touching on that so, so much, but when you put the implant in, you're retrieving it to, compl uh, to, to clean the cement. Sorry, I, I may not have made that clear. So when I put the abutments in and I see the, uh, so it's, it's, it's hand tightened. It's not completely torqued, just hand tightened. And then I cement the crown in, the bridge in, okay? And then I remove the whole thing as a whole, okay? And then I re-deliver it. So now I've cleaned the underside of the, the bridge. Does that make sense? Yeah, his, his additional comment was, um, I was of the understanding that screwmentable meant cementing extra orally and putting the abutment crown complex as a unit, which I think you just answered. Right yeah, now. you can do that too. You can do that too, once you confirm everything. But what I find is, what I find with, um, and why I like hex, right? The problem with, with, with non-engaging, you still can get a bit of rotation on the abutment, right? And in this particular case, that's what I found, right? So, so the lab didn't feel, even though I confirmed it, that I could remove it in and out with the hex, the hex was removed. So the, both of these were not engaging, right? So, so imagine you have a little bit of discrepancy and you go to cement that extra orally, and then you go to bring that intra orally, you're gonna have a discrepancy. Right, even more so because it's non-hexed. Does that make sense? So you don't have to do it extra orally. You can do it intra orally, remove it, um, and then so so for singles for sure. It's it's, it's a beautiful technique, right? Make sense? Thank you, Steve's. Okay, Dr. Diana, I'm happy to uh, chat more with you after if uh, if if need be. Okay, so, okay, and then we're gonna talk about the S-curve, okay? So the S-curve, you know, the umbrella concept, um, I'm not a huge fan of because I think there is a slightly better way um, and kind of do the S-curve, I've got a different term for it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But the reason emergence, one of the factors is need gingival pressure, right? And with gingival pressure, it's, it's, a, it's balancing. Right? How much pressure is, is, is enough? How much is too much? Um, and the first piece of advice I'll give you is maximize the volume first. Okay? I think a lot of people are keen on putting pressure on the tissue right away, right? And sometimes that will impede tissue growth, right? A certain level of gingival pressure is necessary for sure because you want that contact on the, on the, uh, the tissue. It's, it's needed for epithelial adhesion, right? But too much pressure will disturb tissue homeostasis and potentially cause remodeling of that biologic width, right? So one thing that I do um, is I will try to always deliver uh, implant restorations with no freezing if possible. And it, it kind of gives me an idea of how much is, is too much, right? And custom impression copings and whatnot. So, so there's a lot to this. Um, sorry, I can't talk too much, uh, get into too much detail there, but uh, um, important that gingival pressure. You know, too little and you don't have enough contact and you're gonna have gaps everywhere, right? It's not cleansable, right? So in certain cases, you wanna consider narrow healing abutments, right? Like in that bridge case that I showed you, I purposefully use the narrow one. Why? Because I want more volume and it's on a bridge and I can control uh, emergence profile, right? So on a maximum volume of tissue, right? Um, in other situations, you want to maintain, right? Uh, with wider healing abutments or custom healing abutments or attempts to maintain that tissue, right? So sometimes you, uh, so, so it's, it's this phrase, right? You've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, right? Because I think one of the things that's not in the book is different concepts on, on how to maintain bone like immediate implants. This should be part of that book. And I think I, I'm happy that I, I got to listen to Azim's talk is that I think immediate implants should be considered a zero bone loss concept 
Why? Because when you temporize the tissue properly, you're pre preventing tissue reorganization to some degree, aren't you? Right? That temp is holding that tissue body. And we know once we, when we don't have a temp and we don't have an immediate implant, what happens to that bone and tissue, it resorbs, right? So here's a case that I did. Um, this case was actually socket shield. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but another concept on preserving bone, right? Using the roots. So this is a double socket shield. Um, this is a uh, know when to uh, hold them, right? Because this, I had extracted roots, the pillar there. I want to hold that tissue, right? Best that I can. Now, don't look too close to the socket shield. It's, there's errors in this, but we won't get into that today. Um, and that's what that looks like, right? Because you want to maintain that tissue, right? You push too much, you're going to lose that papilla, right? If you go back here, if you look at the temp, you want to make sure you open that up. The tendency is to, you know, if you want to close that too much, you're going to squeeze that papilla and you're not going to get that, uh, uh, that adhesion. Okay. There we go. And what I'm seeing with these implant uh, designs um, and why that is so important to the, the tissue compression is I see a lot of this. Uh, and I've, we've all do, done this. You, you do enough implants, you, you will have an x-ray that looks like this, right? Um, it's a narrow site for sure, but look at the mismatch, right? Can you appreciate that a flat to flat connection may have a little bit more difficulty in, in seating? Not only that, you should have a design of a healing abutment or pressure coping that uh, flares at an appropriate distance, right? It drives me crazy when I see implant designs where they have impression copings uh, and the minimum impression coping width is wider than the implant itself, right? It drives me crazy. So there should be consideration for this tissue compression and emergence, and it does matter, okay? Right, this is that short tie base we're talking about, right? Where is that tissue gonna remodel there okay. over time? Probably lower. Will it make a big deal? Well, maybe not. Maybe that type of remodeling is okay, right? How about here, right? Look at how steep that, uh, the abutment angle is, right? And, and this one, that's threaded pretty good, probably roughly to the surface as well. And, you know, um, what happens if that connection, um, you know, you get a little bit of bacteria down there and boop, goes down the implant, okay? So here's an interesting one. Um, uh, the last few, not my cases, but, um, and, and I, I hope I don't come off as, as, as criticizing, believe me, I. I you do enough implants, you're gonna get failures and get some, um, some funny things that happen to your implants. They've certainly happened to mine. Um, but I use this just, you know, we, we should all learn from each other, right? So, so this particular case, you know, the, the doctor was looking at uh, on the left, make a beautiful custom impression coping. And then got that on the right. And you can see the discrepancy if that custom impression coping is a match for the, uh, the, the, um, the implant uh, tissue, then it cannot possibly look like that on the right. But let's be honest why this happened. is because the tie base was made too short. At the time, probably the only kind that they had, but they wanted to use tie bases because the, maybe this is a zirconia or, or lithium disilicate abutment and it's more aesthetic. Right, so um, these mismatches is, is a bit of a problem. Now, when this remodels, who knows what can happen there, right? Maybe still work out okay. But the idea is we don't wanna lose bone because when you have a change in um, uh, the, the architecture, you're, you're driving the biology to, to remodel, right? And that can be a dangerous thing sometimes. Okay, here's another case. So, you know, it looks to me like this implant is almost placed at the, the, the tissue level, okay? I, I suspect it's not correct, but 
I can tell you that th this angulation is a problem, right? I think we can all see that. But let's look at what that looks like in um, clinically or radiographically. So you can see that this very, very steep angle of that tie base and right up to that, the, the interface, okay? And a 45 degree angle, chances are you're going to get some bone resorption if this is done subcrestally, which it kind of looks like it, it is, okay? So now it doesn't mean it will, right? The connection may still be strong enough, okay? But I, you know, I don't know too much about biorhizons, to be honest with you. But let's look at the, the emergence profile here. So let's assume that's where the tissue is, the tissue volume, okay, subcrestally, okay? This is what he made as a temporary abutment, okay? A very, very steep angle, right? Another steep angle. This is what I call the S-curve, right? It's the hourglass, right? So, Sometimes people have a problem with this. Um, I think because they feel that with the other design, um, outside of the fact that that's just where the margin is, they have to place that there, right? That they wanna push it out because they feel they're gonna get a contact, or right? they're gonna push that tissue out to the contact. And I'm gonna tell you now, in my opinion, it, it will have a negative effect on the contact, not a positive, okay? So, can we all agree that the contact and, and you know, Tarnow's study is famous for this, that it's, it's a reflection of the distance between the bony crest and the contact point, right? Not so much the immediate tissue right next to the abutment, right? And so that's what an S-curve would look like there, okay? And we're preserving where that red star is. We're preserving that biologic width as well, giving that implant as much tissue as we possibly can. And the question is, is will it still affect the inapproximal tissue? Because we still want a papilla if possible, right? So let's look at this next slide, right? This is what I call cutting the corner, okay? That first millimeter to two millimeters should, in my opinion, almost always be straight on. If your implant is deep enough, and, it, and again, not all implants are made to be subcrestal, but you know, be cognizant of how deep you place your implants, right? So I like it straight. Why? Because we want to maximize as much tissue, if it's there, tissue around that implant, right? And then what I do, or my lab naturally does, is they cut that corner. And that's where that compression of tissue is. And we still maintain the biologic width, okay? But are we compressing enough? That's the question, right? Well, let's compare the two. If we look at both of those designs, okay? Yes, granted, the other one is compressing more, but what happens if that remodels, okay? Are we in fact gonna compress more? or compress less, I think less. And it surely, I think in this particular case, will remodel in that, in that uh, position. Okay, so be, and in fact, less tissue and more of a dip between the implant margin or, or the connection and the, the, the adjacent crest. But the contact point is really, or, or, or the, the pill is more about that distance again, right? And if you look at where the white and red lines intersect, I can comfortably get that intersecting point to be quite similar. In fact, I probably could even tease it a little bit more. So in my opinion, no need to cut, uh, to, to push out so drastically at the, uh, the junction, push it out gradually, okay? So the S curve, right? In this particular case, you're better off changing the crown, right? Get that contact point lower. Steve, um, Azim has a question. His question yeah. is, what are your thoughts about the VPI cervical kit and shaping the tissues excessively versus standard healing abutments five to seven millimeters wide? And he also says solid presentation too. Oh, <laughs> thanks, brother. Um, so I have the VPI kit uh, and I've used it. Uh, I have two, uh, two concerns with it. It, it just 
in my opinion. Um, it's kind of difficult to control height, right? So I'm not, it's very easy for me to seal the, uh, the, the, the socket, if you will, right? It's, it's the curvature that's most important, right? And what I find with that particular um, uh, uh, kit, it has, yes, it does have an emergence profile, but it doesn't control height. So I wish it would give a little bit more options. The other part is, and, and again, this is more my problem and, and not knowing enough about it. Um, you know, composite is not necessarily the best material to be subgingival. Um, it's actually quite rough, in my opinion. And I know they, they glaze it and whatever, I think you can, but you'll see later in my lecture, I, I don't think personally that that's a um, composite is the best choice. Now, I know what you're saying, thinking, we do it anyway, right? We do immediate implants anyway, and we do composite. Yeah, because there's a trade-off. We want to preserve, uh, we want to hold that tissue, right? So if you're using a custom abutment, uh, fine, maybe you know, don't have any other option. But when you're using a healing abutment, you've got a nice sterile healing abutment that, um, uh, that's titanium, which tissue likes. Um, I think, mark my words, I think very shortly they're going to start moving abutments to be out of zirconia, not uh, titanium. Um, that's for another day. Um, so, so I think to answer your question, uh, I like it. I just I think there are some some detriments to it, and, and expensive for what it is. I mean, you can probably just do it with a custom temp. And I mean, Zim, I've seen your temps. You can do this in your sleep. Um, just my two cents. I hope that helps. Is that okay, Chef? That was absolutely. He says um, thank you. Um, thanks for great. Thanks for the answer. Okay. Okay, so, so now we'll get to sort of the, the last little bit, um, subgingival materials, okay? And this may answer uh, Azim's question a little bit, right? To quote Linkovicius again, to choose the best materials, it is necessary to have a functional understanding of the tissues themselves. Um, I'm first to admit it, man, I don't have a very good idea of what materials do to tissue. Right, I, it was never in my mindset, um, but I'm going to start looking a little bit more closer. Um, okay, so he he talks about two zones, uh, the plaque zone and the adherence zone, and we've already talked about this, right? We talked about uh, the the one to one point five millimeters closest to the implant being the the connective tissue, right? Actual fibroblasts organizing around the implant, right? Then the adherence zone, which is the junctional epithelium that attaches to the restoration. That's where the hemidesmosomes are, epithelial attachment. This is the part that when you remove an abutment, you start to see it bleed. Why is it bleeding? Because you're, you're tearing that adhesion and there, it's vascular, okay? So that's the protective part. And then there's the sulcular part, which is where the plaque will reside, all right? So the question, so again, junctional epithelium and sulcular epithelium, right? So the question that he asked is, is there a material that can reduce the plaque zone and increase the adherence zone, All right? And then, well, it brings us to two of the main materials that we use, right? Titanium versus zirconia. Uh, I will admittedly here, admit here that I don't use zirconia that often. That touches tissue. I mostly use titanium, but now I have to really rethink this, okay? Uh, I definitely don't use all zirconia, on, like on the right, okay? That's, that, that's a different issue, a, a mechanical issue, okay? Um, I'm mostly an anodized titanium custom abutment. But what has he shown? So it's about tissue adhesion, right? Fibroblast versus epithelial cells, right? So the fibroblast we talked about is that one millimeter zone right above the implant, right? And it's kind of loose. It's not really, it's like scar tissue. It just kind of sits there 
it's, it doesn't penetrate into the implant, it just sort of organized parallel around the implant, right? That's that zone. And it's constant, it will reorganize to that most of the time. But more coronally to that, that's, that's the sweet spot, that's the epithelial cells, right? That's the direct contact to the restoration, the first barrier, junctional epithelium, that's where the uh, the, the hemidesmosomes will attach to the implant surface. So with that logic, so there's the attachment. I showed you that slide before, okay? We want a material that will better attach to the epithelium, right? A lot of kind of implant companies talk about fibroblasts, attaching the fibroblasts, but the reality is not really the fibroblasts that they need to attach to. It's the the, the hemidesmosomal attachment to the epithelium, right? And so they've done studies on this. And as I said earlier, this, they are, there's so much research on, on surface texture that goes behind the scenes that we're, we're not privy to. Um, but they've done these studies. And what they found is that zirconia binds better to hemidesmosomes, right? And on top of that, Zirconia has, uh, there's less adhesion to, uh, from bacteria, right? Because zirconia, you can polish really, really high, okay? It's the most polishable uh, uh, material that we have in dentistry, okay? And it doesn't corrode. Now, I should also mention that there was a study by uh, uh, Dr. Wadwani. Uh, uh, he famously talked about reusing healing abutments, right? So, the problem with that is that there is a physical attachment to the titanium and that when you remove that and you sterilize it, there's still going to be uh, remnants of tissue there. Okay. And then when you go back to put it in, in, in place and on a new patient, are you going to get the same type of, of, of adhesion of hemidesmosomes? Unlikely because you've got a contaminated surface, right? So, so it's about the surface to surface connection to uh, adhesion to the tissue, right? The other part, zirconia doesn't corrode. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. So if titanium, and you've seen this when you sterilize titanium and you get like a different sort of look to it, you know, it's there's some corrosion there, and will the tissue bind to that material as well as a, a, a pristine surface? Unlikely. Okay. And there are studies that show that there's less inflammation around uh, zirconia. Okay. Steve, we have a question from Puneet while we're on this uh, subject. She yes. says, what is your opinion on molar emergence profile with peak abutments? With peak abutments. Okay, so uh, I've, I've done a few with peak. Uh, there is some data that suggests that peak does uh, work favorably to uh, with fibroblasts. Okay, so, uh, but the, it's still emerging research. I, I don't think they've, they've concluded that. I know Nobel cells like cut um, these sort of molar shaped uh, um, <clears throat> healing abutments. Um, they do, they, they work nice, but I think it has to do with the, the surface texture. It can probably make it pretty clean. Right, and pretty smooth. So, excuse me. <coughs> Not Corona. Okay. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, she did. She says thank you. Okay. And lastly, it should be noted that it's the low surface energy, right? Uh, so, so bacteria doesn't want to adhere to it. So there seems to be this sort of um, really uh, a benefit to using zirconia in the soft tissue interface. <clears throat> now, I don't want to confuse that with the interface at the implant level, okay? That's for another day. Um, at the implant level, there's more mechanic pro mechanical problems that we have to deal with. Um, so, so anyway, we'll stick with just the tissue, okay? And then I'll leave you with one, uh, this last slide. Because <clears throat> um, I know there's a lot of, probably a lot of Sarek users here. So I think, you know, for, for, for you guys, 
uh, listen up to this part. Maybe you're already doing this, and I'm not entirely sure what your protocol is. But the studies show <clears throat> that epithelial cells, the part in that junctional epithelium, the part that protects the implant, that seals, does not adhere to veneering uh, ceramics. The glaze is actually quite rough. Okay, so if you're doing uh, tie bases and Emacs, okay, so you want to be uh, careful there. And so what he recommends is don't glaze it. Okay, that subgingival portion, okay, just polish it. Now he has a protocol, you have to read it in the book, uh, to how to polish it. Um, but you may be better off, instead of using Emacs, use uh, zirconia. I think now you have that ability to, to make abutments out of zirconia. Um, Shan, correct me if I'm wrong. You can do now, uh, you can mill using CEREC uh, zirconia abutments? That is correct. Awesome. Awesome. So, so don't glaze that. Polish it. Okay. So what they found in terms of biocompatibility, zirconia is the best, right? Unglazed, high polish, and then he has a very specific protocol. Titanium still works. So I'm not suggesting you know throw that out. Uh, it, it, it's just not quite as as good in um, its tissue response. And you know, a lot of the people who are uh, selling zirconia implants, right? They will prey on that part, right? Um, but there are other issues with zirconia implants that uh, they don't talk about. So, so just be careful there. It's not it's not the same thing, right? Um, and then Emacs or lithium bisilicate, and then veneering cements, no attachment. So if there's no attachment to the veneering cement, right? What's going to happen? It's going to want to reorganize to make an attachment, then you're gonna get crustal bone loss, right? So, um, <clears throat> I'll leave you with one last quote from him. Um, is no one factor is the most important to ensure crustal bone stability. It is the combination and interaction of factors that determine the outcome, okay? I think I said that at the beginning. Um, and then lastly, it is only through accepting this multifactorial reality that clinicians can change their thinking and begin on the path to zero bone loss. Okay, Thomas Linkovicious. Everyone buys the book. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your attention. Um, be safe and healthy. I wish you guys all the best. Uh, I know it's a bit of a, a tough time for everybody. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we got the chance to connect and uh, wish you guys and your family all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. We're going to go ahead and um, leave a couple of minutes open for any type of questions and answers. Um, now, Steve, um, uh, Vithant asks, could you glaze then polish off? Uh, yeah, I suppose you could. You just don't want to leave leave any remnant of that glaze, mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Uh, Mike Ma says, can you elaborate more on the one abutment, one time concept with multi units? Okay, so the, the one abutment, one time, um, so picture you put it, it, an implant in, right? And your first thing is you do a, uh, a healing abutment, right? A traditional healing abutment. And then what do you do when you go to impress, right? You remove that healing abutment, right? And the tissue around there, you just stripped all of the, um, uh, the, connect, uh, the, the hemidesmosomal attachments, all the, all the tissue around there has now been stripped from whatever connection that is around the implant, right? Now, if, it, if your tissue is thick enough, it's going to be resistant to remodeling, truthfully. And again, if there's you know, proximity of, of, of teeth. But if you're not careful in thin tissue, you're going to, that tissue is going to remodel, right? And you may lose tissue there. So the idea of the one abutment one time is to, once you put the implant in and you put an intermediary abutment. That intermediary abutment does not come out. It stays there, okay? So 
whatever attachment detachment that you're doing is at the tissue level now. Okay. And so you're not stripping any of those fibers and they've shown where, you know, there's some, some, um, uh, some x-rays I, I didn't put in the presentation where he puts an implant and the, the one abutment, um, and there's bone on the abutment. Right. Um, and so if you were to remove that abutment for whatever reason, what's going to happen, the bone's going to, die back to the implant uh, uh, connection, right? So to me, it makes sense. However, um, practically it's, it's a lot more work um, to um, stick in the tissue instead. Uh, three, it's a lot like a tissue level, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole point. The tissue level keeps the connection above the bone, uh, far away from the bone. But the problem with that is now you have prosthetic problems, right? What happens if you have to change it, right? So I guess it kind of blends the two worlds. Um, I don't use it. I, I've, I've, I've heard plenty of lectures on it. I know some people that, that swear by it. I don't see a huge difference, to be honest. And the literature is not, um, it's not 100% sold on it. Does that make sense? Hope that helps? Yes, it does. Um, I want to make another quick announcement real quick uh, with regards to tomorrow's lecture. Um, the topic is going to be, uh, this is with Dr. Um, Gotsu at 3 p.m. The topic will be on modern prosthodontic workflow. So make sure you tune in. It's going to be a very, very good one. Uh, Steve, the next question is from Dr. Murad, and he asks, Dr. Chen, what is your opinion on the use of two different materials in terms of strength longevity, elasticity, when it comes to titanium implants with a zirconia abutment? Well, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, let me rephrase. Uh, so, this, so essentially the strength of a zirconia abutment on a titanium implant? So the, the, I think the question overall is the use of two different materials in terms of strength, longevity, and elasticity um, so I think, for example, when it comes to a titanium implant with a zirconia abutment. Okay, so if you could maybe be more specific, where is the zirconia and where is the titanium? Uh, we'll just wait for, um, for him to go ahead and... Okay, so let me elaborate a little bit. Go ahead. Zirconia as a whole, right? Um, the reason I, I never use zirconia, I'm not even sure they make this anymore, zirconia as a connector, right, at the connection interface, right, is that, I mean, you've seen, you saw that video, right, the micro motion video, yeah. right, zirconia has no give, right, what it has is propagation, um, like the way that the, the lattice works, it can kind of prevent fracture until it doesn't, and then it, and then it's broken, right, so, um, I personally don't like zirconia on my implant itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would rather have an interface of, uh, uh, of titanium, right? So the problem there is that, and this is where tie bases become a problem, is that the, the titanium is more forgiving at the connection, but to put zirconia where it matters in that connection, you need a you know, you need a certain platform with your tie base, right? So it automatically needs a little bit of width. And then you have to put your zirconia, right, abutment. And then you're going to cement your lithium disilicate crown, right? So I understand the concept of the tissue adherence. It might be more protective. But for me, even still reading this, I don't know. I, I, I still have to, you know, maybe do a little bit more research. I might still want titanium, highly polished, right? Um, I, it, and my lab will anodize it so it can make it pink and make it gold. Um, and, and I'll use that to get soft tissue adherence, in my, my opinion. That, that's just, just, just my workflow. Um, and and he, he said you answered, he said you did answer the question, and I think his was more uh, geared towards um, just fracture. Um, which, which is good. Uh, the next question is for Omar Jajani. Uh, he asks, regarding the cutting the corner technique, if I understand it correctly, does it help to allow less tissue compression initially, but then 
more compression long term as opposed to other techniques so uh this is that whole uh, uh no one to hold it no one to fold it kind of thing right so um eventually there's no pressure right it's going to remodel so the idea is if you're going to compress the tissue and move it away when you, you have some healing potential, then you're better off not to uh, compress it at all and then compress it later, okay? If your goal is to hold that tissue, papilla, right? Once you, once you take out a tooth and the papilla has an opportunity, that's when you wanna hold it. Not necessarily pressure, like enough pressure just to keep that papilla there. But like that bridge case, right? Um, there isn't a huge value for me to put a huge healing abutment now, right? Because that pushes that tissue. I had enough KT already. It pushes that tissue away. And understand that when you have a wide healing abutment, right? You're no longer, you're pushing the tissue away from the crest of the, uh, the, crest of the bone and the implant, right? So that's why for me, I'd rather have a tall, thin healing abutment. And then when I know I, I, I've already prosthetically planned this, I can cut the corner and still get a good emergence profile anyway. In some cases, it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes you have to have that emergence, right? So immediate anteriors and whatnot. So, um, so there's a balancing act there. My advice, if, if you're sort of getting into prosthetic planning, um, uh, draw it out on your computer. Take that x-ray, put it on Photoshop or whatever, and literally draw your emergence profile. And then you'll start to see, ah, you know what, maybe I need to go a little bit deeper, this and that. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, nuance to that part. I hope, sorry, I, I'm not sure I answered that question. Right? Omar said that makes perfect sense. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Did you hear me, uh, Steve? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah Omar says, so, yeah, so I think that's all for all of all of the questions um thank you everybody for joining today it was uh steve it was absolutely incredible very insightful as always um we're gonna also be making some uh announcements for april 14th to the 17th and the 20, 20th and 21st later on maybe perhaps a friday we have another star studded lineup for uh, that we have lined up for you guys in about two weeks so um, stay tuned for those announcements. All of the speakers have more or less confirmed the dates, but we're just going to hold off until Friday um, to make those announcements. Uh, once again, thanks everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out Thank of you your not so bit not so busy schedules, but uh, you know for for joining us today. And I hope you found today's lecture uh, very insightful by Dr. Chang. I, I sure did. Thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone.